You are listening to Down Home. Before we begin today's episode, we want to issue a trigger warning. This episode contains discussions of anti-Black and anti-Asian violence, including descriptions of racially motivated attack, systemic oppression, and historical trauma. We understand that these topics can be deeply distressing and may evoke strong emotional responses. We encourage you to take care of yourself while listening. If you find yourself feeling overwhelmed or in need of support, please don't hesitate to reach out to a trusted friend, family member, or a mental health professional. Remember, it's okay to pause, skip, or stop listening if at any point you need to prioritize your well-being. Your mental and emotional health are important to us. Thank you for tuning in. Often truth is uncomfortable, and there is perhaps no more uncomfortable truth than anti-black violence that stains the fabric of this land. It's a topic that many shy away from, a subject that some would rather leave untouched. But the Down Home Podcast refuses to turn away. Me and Jay understand the discomfort that comes with discussing this painful history. There are those who argue that the past should stay in the past. Yet, to not know or understand our history is not just dangerous. It's dismissive of those whose lives were shattered by the brutality of racism. In today's episode, we will be talking about anti-black or so-called race riots that have happened in Canada and the U.S. The actual term race riot is a misleading term. It implies that the violence was a spontaneous eruption of conflict between different racial groups. However, in many cases, what is labeled as a race riot was actually a targeted attack by white mobs against BIPOC communities. These acts of violence were often premeditated, organized, and carried out with the intention of terrorizing and subjugating people of color. Using the term race riot can obscure the power dynamics at play. It suggests that both sides were actually responsible for the violence when in reality the aggressors were often white individuals or groups fueled by racist ideologies. But for lack of a better term, you will hear me and Jay use the words throughout the episode, often begrudgingly. I'm Derek Wise and on behalf of Jay Jones, welcome to Down Home, the Canadian experience by two black men. There was no shortage of American yeah, information. Yeah, tons, tons, tons. But tons. um, what, what? Well, before we get into the American stuff, did you find any type of Canadian information that you thought was interesting? Um, the there was a big riot in 1784, apparently in Nova Scotia, the yeah. Shelbourne race riots, where a preacher was his house was bombarded by. Uh, you know, I guess a white mob, and they used uh, hooks and chains that they got from a, a ship down in the harbor and went to his house and shit. So that's yeah. pretty much that's pretty much all I've seen. I'm sure there was other ones, yeah. but uh, well, let's talk about that one because um, I I found that as well, of course. Mm-hmm. But um, we kind of alluded to this one before because it was the incident that. Um, kind of precipitated the the British authorities bringing up the guys from Jamaica, the Maroons, the Maroons from Jamaica. That's that's the incident that kind of precipitated that. Mm-hmm. But what I found interesting because you know uh, history is always told by through the guise of um, our white society, mm-hmm. like our British white society, right? So mm-hmm. every, everything that I found. Um, kind of talked about what kind of led yes. to those those things. Did you did you, did you find that like a like I, I saw this thing that I saw a couple of different sources, but one source said that these uh, they called them um, what they call them they called them white refugees from mm-hmm. Britain. Mm-hmm. I don't know quite what that means, but anyway, <laughs> yeah. So the yeah. so the like white refugees from from Britain we're finding that the British authorities were not holding true to their promises of land. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. So that was coming slowly. So 
to stem the tide, they did very much what the black loyalists had to do was ba basically work as laborers. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But, you know, there was a problem because the, the black loyalists were willing to work for less because they were coming from situations where they weren't being paid at all. Mm -hmm, yeah. Right. So their, their, their labor was cheaper. They probably worked harder too, to be honest. Mm -hmm. But, <laughs> but yeah. um, and so there was, there was discontent there and yeah, yeah. that kind of led to what, what they're calling a, a race riot. Mm -hmm. But the, the gentleman that they, they targeted was, it was interesting too. Did you read anything about him? Uh, no, I, I, I didn't, but, uh, back to the, the British thing though, there was also a lot of some of these race riots, uh, later on, uh, in that area of time were a, a lot of fallouts from the first world war, believe it or yeah. not, leading from slavery into the first world into war, the first world war and yeah. a need for laborers, like you say, and the, the sort of the white workers were upset that, there was a mass amount of uh, laborers needed and they were angry that the blacks were getting the so-called work or they were given promotions to, to, to do whatever. And uh, I've seen a, a lot of the discontentment arise from, uh, you know, that um, there's also the civil rights movement from 64 to 69, yeah, yeah. 26 cities across the States were, you know, in racial violence, violence. And the biggest thing I, what, what I noticed through all this, we'll get back to you in a sec, but is the definition of race riot. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's it, crazy. It, huh? <laughs> it's a riot that is caused by racial anger, racial so, tension, racial anger. Right, right there. You're dividing people to say, Oh, if you blacks, you know, the black race, and it goes back to what your mom was saying. Like there needs to be a, a, a thing across the board like there are no races man it's human race and so that puts us into a category already it's like oh the black race is acting up they're fighting and a lot of these riots they were they were um happened because of retaliation in defense not at an offense through the blacks mm -hmm. they were always given an alt like some sort of thing that they had to fight for, for like the, there was a race riot in 1919 in chicago where a boy just happened to drift drift over into a swimming area where whites were the the white mob got angry and started stoning him in the summer of 1919 amidst the aftermath of world war one america was engulfed in a wave of anti-black violence the chicago race riot of 1919 was not an isolated incident but one of 25 large-scale eruptions of hate and brutality that scarred the nation Encyclopedia Britannica tells us that these events, often labeled as riots, were fueled by a toxic mix of factors. This particular event unfolded in response to the Great Migration, as African Americans sought refuge and opportunity in the industrial hubs in northern United States. Yet with their arrival came increased competition for jobs and a rising tide of hostility from groups like the Ku Klux Klan. The Chicago Race Riot of 1919 started on July 27th with an act of segregation. A young African-American child, innocently trying to cool off in a public swimming area of Lake Michigan, found himself in the white-only section. He was hit with rocks thrown by a white man from the shore and shortly drowned from his injuries. When the police failed to arrest the white man, the black community gathered at the beach calling for justice. What ensued was not a riot but a brutal onslaught of violence against black residents that lasted for a staggering 13 days. By the time the dust settled, the cost was immeasurable. 38 lives lost, 23 black lives, 15 white lives, over 500 people injured, their wounds evidence of the ferocity of hate. And in the wake of this devastation, the once thriving African-American neighborhoods lay in ruins. Imagine the faces of thousands of black families their homes reduced to ashes, their lives uprooted in an instant. This was not just an event in history, it was a catastrophe that reverberated through generations. The racial uh, violence that happened in Shelburne back in 1784, that's there were the, the pastor at that time, uh, his name was David George. Yes. And he actually was... Uh, 
much like a lot of the pastors and, and preachers in Nova Scotia at that time and leading all the way up until, you know, our our formative years, they were community mm-hmm. leaders, right? Yes, yeah, yeah. And he was no different. So what he did um, was, but he welcomed everyone. <laughs> yeah. Right. Including the white people in his neighborhood. So he was baptizing white people, baptizing black people. And a lot of the the whites in the area did not, they wanted to continue the racial divide. So they did not appreciate um, his welcoming of the community and bringing people mm-hmm. together. So th- that's the preacher that they targeted. That's crazy. Man. In that, yeah. uh, in that neighborhood. Mm-hmm. Um, and that together with, um, like I was saying, like like you're like you were saying, actually the 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 response to um, losing jobs, not losing jobs, just being um, a lot of these uh, landowners would take. Of course, you're gonna you're gonna go with the lowest wage offer, right? Of course, yeah. So um, that's what was happening in the the the, the area yeah. before that time, but it um, and that's widely considered the first quote unquote race riot in North America back in mm-hmm. 1784 in uh in uh Shelby. Just before we go into the other stuff, like it's interesting because we we talked about this before about how a lot of the documented there there isn't a lot of documented uh violence towards the black community in Canada. Mm-hmm. And that's because a lot of it is really insidious. Yeah. It's um it's under the radar. Mm-hmm. Like when when pe- when the authorities come in and take land from black people, it's always legislated. Yeah. So it's not under the guise of violence. It's no. it's like they have this paper saying, "Well, you have to move because we're doing this with this land that you don't even own anyway." Yeah, it's so the guys of law, yeah. really. Yeah, guys of law. So that that um. That happened in. Uh, I know we wanted to talk about this later, but Hogan's Alley. That's that's what happened there, mm-hmm. yeah. and it happened to, of course, uh, Africville. But yeah. um, Canada has a lot of stains on their head when it on their hands when it comes to um, racial violence. And just to step out of outside of uh, uh, our ethnicity, the the one of the largest ones was uh, nineteen oh seven. There was an anti-Asian riot yes, in, right. in Vancouver, right? Yeah, yeah. On September 7th, 1907, a disgusting scene unfolded in front of Vancouver City Hall, etching a dark mark on Canadian history. It was a day of hostility as thousands of people gathered to voice their vehement opposition to Asian immigration. Among them were members of the newly formed Asiatic Exclusion League, their signs bearing the racist call for an all-white Canada. Chanting anti-Asian slogans, the protesters surged into Vancouver's Chinatown, leaving a wake of destruction in their path. Chinese-owned businesses, symbols of livelihood and community, were ruthlessly vandalized and destroyed. The fury of the mob didn't stop there. Spurred by bigotry and fueled by ignorance, the crowd descended upon a neighborhood teeming with Japanese immigrants. What ensued was not just a riot, but a vicious onslaught of violence that tore through the streets of Vancouver for two whole days. Yeah, it's it's so sad that the mentality of, just the narrative of like, you know, growing up, uh, I remember in the formative years where you'd hear some people say, like in the community, the older people, they're like, oh, you know, there it would be, I didn't understand it at the time, but it was racially loaded in the sense of, oh, those immigrants are coming to take mm. our job. You know yeah, what I yeah, mean? Yeah. And and there was even a divide at a time when blacks weren't even the problem. It was the fact that immigrants, right? Mm. But that's still a loaded thing. So you take away the immigrant complaint, and then that's why it always got turned to blacks. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, yeah, it's uh, it's it's quite sad that this has been a narrative over time and how it distinctly gets put into these racial categories. And people don't even know what racial riots really are. They just they just say it is because, oh, it's blacks, it's Asian, it's it's whoever up against the system. It's the systematic things that have led us 
all here right now. It's yeah. because we can't see how what was created is the construct of these walls that we're trying to break back down now, you know? Yeah, exactly. So can Canada is not immune to it, man. Not at all. Like the, like don't have like anybody that says that they they don't and like it's hard because this is stuff that is not taught in schools. Right. Yeah. Right. I I actually found one that I had no idea about and again it, it's not centered around our ethnicity but the the Christie Pitts riots. Oh, I didn't hear about that. Yeah, man. Yeah. So this was an anti-Semitic riot. Oh, so of okay. course, yeah, 1933, mm-hmm. right? Um, there, there were a, there was a, a large Jewish population still is around the Christie Pitts area in Toronto, right? And there, there was at that time, pe- people don't understand uh, the Nazi movement and Hitler was very popular in North America. Man. Yeah. Like people think, oh, he's evil. But no, there, there, he, he had a lot of backers. He had in, followers, yep. followers in North America. So there, there was a baseball game in Christie Christy Pitts, 1933, August 14th. And there was a, uh, like a Jewish league team. Mm-hmm. And there, you know, there was a lot of people there and there was a bunch of people with homemade swastikas all over the place. Yeah. And that precipitated a, a humongous fight. There was about 10,000 10, people involved in the skirmish all around the Christie Pitts area. Wow. Yeah. And like they and like these people were 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 shouting uh anti-Jewish, anti-Semitic slogans. Mm-hmm. This is in Canada, in yeah. Toronto. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right? Yeah. It's uh it it doesn't take much to to create a mob mentality, you know. No, if you're man. if you're not if you're not considered the you know, the superior race, then yeah. you're considered something else, you know? Yeah, exactly. And uh, yeah, I had no idea the Christie yeah. Pitts things, and it just goes to show you of the the levels of, uh, you know, I hate to say it, man, the levels of white supremacy that still breeds. You know, mm. if Hitler, think about that, like Hitler. You know, I'm not surprised in North America because look, look at that instance in the Olympics. Mm. It just goes to show you how much how powerful he was, and the world knew what he what he was up to, and you know what they were dominant. That they were trying to be dominant and take out the world. The Hitler Olympics, officially known as the 1936 Summer Olympics held in Berlin, Germany, were a highly controversial and politically charged event. Adolf Hitler and the Nazi regime seized the opportunity to use the Olympics as a propaganda tool to showcase their vision of an Aryan supremacy and the supposed superiority of the German race. Despite initial calls for a boycott due to Nazi policies of discrimination and persecution, many countries, including the United States, chose to participate. The games were meticulously orchestrated to present an image of peaceful and progressive Germany to the world. One of the most iconic moments was the participation of African-American athlete Jesse Owens, who won four gold medals in track and field events. His victories challenged the Nazi myth of Aryan racial superiority. However, behind the facade of unity and sportsmanship, the reality was starkly different. Jewish athletes were removed from the German teams, and the games were used to promote Nazi ideology. Anti-Semitic propaganda continued throughout the event, and the Nazis carefully controlled the image projected to the world. A lot of people boycotted, but a lot of people still uh, sent sent their their countries to 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 Germany to, yeah. to face in the Olympics, and look what they uh, you know had to endure there. Like yeah. you know Jesse Owens, you know, mm. um, and they were considered the Aryan white race that were supposed to be so dominant, and uh, the other countries came in and did their thing to prove otherwise. Yeah. But uh, you know that that. Uh, Hitler being that popular is not lost, you no, because it still exists today. It's just yeah, tell me morphed in, morphed into other things yeah. and or other ways. You know, hate is hate, yeah. and you you can't you know you can call yeah. it what you want. Like delving into the American incidences, it's there's all it was overwhelming. Yeah, you know what I mean. There, there's so many. Mm-hmm. It was um, it was sad. 
<laughs> yeah, it is, man. Like this is I can see why this isn't a popular subject to talk about. No. Yeah. Um, I know you know, I can see why people want to kind of scrape this under the carpet, but and it's it's not a great thing to talk about. Like like yeah. I, I almost don't even know where to start with the Americans though. Yeah. Like of course there's Tulsa, right? Mm-hmm. The Tulsa Anti-Black Massacre happened on May 31st, 1921 in Tulsa, Oklahoma. It stands as one of the most devastating incidents of racial violence in American history. What began as an interaction in an elevator between a young black man, Dick Rowland, and a white woman, Sarah Page, quickly escalated into a citywide display of hatred and destruction. As false rumors of an assault on Page spread through the city's white community, the local newspaper, the Tulsa Tribune, published an article urging swift action against Rowland. Fueled by intolerance and hate, a white mob gathered outside the Tulsa County Courthouse, demanding Rowland be handed over to them. I think back in the day, they called that a lynch mob. In the early hours of June 1st, 1921, the situation exploded into violence. White riders, armed with guns and makeshift weapons, stormed into the vibrant African-American neighborhood of Greenwood, known as Black Wall Street, for its thriving businesses, prosperous black professionals, and a bustling community life. What followed was a scene of unimaginable horror. Homes and businesses were looted, vandalized, and set ablaze. The streets of Greenwood, once filled with the sounds of laughter and commerce, were now engulfed in chaos and flames. African-American residents, men, women, and children were targeted and killed mercilessly. 300 black lives were lost, innocent victims of unchecked racial animosity and unchecked violence. For two days, the city of Tulsa was gripped by anarchy and terror. The Oklahoma National Guard was called in, not to protect the residents of Greenwood, but to enforce martial law and detain thousands of black citizens in internment camps. The aftermath of the Tulsa Massacre was a landscape of devastation. The once prosperous Greenwood lay in ruins, its businesses reduced to ashes, the streets littered with the remnants of shattered lives. Thousands of African American families were left homeless and displaced. There's the, uh, the, it's basically what we were talking about before too, in Detroit, there was another uprising based on jobs and, mm. and stuff that turned into race riot. You know, it seems to be always the underpinning, right? Mm -hmm. Like, um, like there's always something that sparks it off. Yeah, but there's always that underpinning of, well, they're taking our jobs, they're doing this or whatever, yeah. right? Yeah. But um, or or there's some sort of sparking incident. Like if you look at, um, the the uh, like the Watts riots, sixty five. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That was precipitated by the cops pulling over someone that was supposedly a drunk driver mm -hmm. and roughing this poor man up. Yeah. Right? And, and then it escalated. The Watts riots, which occurred in August 1965 in the Watts neighborhood of Los Angeles, California, were a pivotal moment in the civil rights movement. The uprising was sparked by long-standing racial tensions police brutality, and economic inequality. Lasting for six days, the riots resulted in 34 deaths, over 1,000 injuries, and extensive property damage. And that lasted from basically 1964 to 1969. There was a chunk of riots during the civil rights movement mm. when all of a sudden, there was all this discontent. And all Blacks were trying to do, to put it in the perspective from, you know, Blacks, is, you know, imagine uh, they're just trying to get rid of the Jim Crow laws, be yeah. considered equal. You know, things are segregated, yet they're still viewed as something else. And all they were really trying to do, when you break it down, all anybody is trying to do is just survive and bring light to... Uh, what a community is supposed to be. Blacks did that very well at that mm -hmm. particular time because yeah. they stood together in a time of power and camaraderie and knowing that the way the world was wasn't the way it should be. Yep. They paid their dues, yet, you know, uh, this went on. This went mm -hmm. on. And all those civil rights leaders were either dead, put in jail, 
shot, you know, yeah. whatever. It's 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 unreal that what a race, well, what what being human is, what you have to stand up for and what you have to put up with just to be considered equal. Yeah, exactly, man. Now, now if you remember way back in our season one, uh, when we were talking to Walter Borden, long time ago. <laughs> yeah, long time ago. He he actually stated that um, like all civil rights civil rights types movements have borrowed from that era, mm -hmm. the playbook basically yeah. of how to try and gain um, ground in the the you know the with the majority the the political majority the the cultural majority they they borrow from the civil rights era playbook yeah right whether it be the women's rights lgbtq you know all they've all borrowed from the that that era from that that struggle of black americans right mm -hmm. yeah and uh you know and it was just, it was obvious and if people can't look back to that look at that era time to see just how crazy it was and compared to even now some of the things that still exist like mm -hmm. this is what we need to do like mm -hmm. blacks need to look at this uh all different cultures and ethnicities need to look at this as to where the riff is mm -hmm. and why we're having so much problem just sort of just trying to be ourselves yeah you know now in our lifetimes in our lifetimes literally I think the largest um, kind of pocket of 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 um, ethnicity violence that happened, I think, was the 1992 Los Angeles riots, right? Yeah. Like, uh, do you remember all that press? Like, I, I, the thing is, though, we were so young. Mm -hmm. Like, I say young, we were like, well, we were tw uh, 20... 20 years 20. old. 20. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We were 20 at that time, right? Yeah. yeah. So it's like looking back, I don't like I remember watching the Rodney King stuff because of mm -hmm. course we're we're bombarded by American media. Right. And um like I remember the news covering certain aspects of it, but I don't remember how bad it was until all the documentaries started coming out probably yeah. 10 years later, right? I yeah, uh, I remember seeing the footage of Rodney King. Mm. And uh, two things I remember during the, the riots was Rodney King, you know, b being hit whatever he was 64 times in a minute by uh, three or, or however many cops it was with billy clubs. Yeah. You know, and then I remember the other thing which led to when the race, the riots actually happened was sort of that white truck driver. I think yes. his name was Dennis something. And he got hit in the head with a brick. Like he was just trying to protect himself. He was white. Yeah. But uh, I remember those two things. And then I also remember it being the knowledge of uh, hip hop and NWA, knowing that that led to the lens of what cop violence was in America, which I hadn't really understood until I really started listening to their music. Yeah. You know, seeing what it was like in, in Compton and, uh, I didn't really know what they were dealing with at the time, other than the fact that it was just a travesty that Rodney King got, mm. you know, beat and those yeah. cops got off. You know what I mean? Yeah, there like I had no I I read a, I listened to a podcast about it um probably about a year back mm -hmm. and it delved pretty deep into it. Mm -hmm. Um like there were 50 people that were killed. Um, according to this information here, 2,300 people injured yeah. and $1 billion in property damage, right? Yeah. Now, yeah. that it was precipitated by those cops getting off, but um, there was a young girl that was shot by an Asian lady like um, a week, a week or it was a year or two, I think, before um, this right. riot. The young lady we were referring to is Latasha Harlins, a 15-year-old African-American girl who was shot and killed by Soon Ja Du, a Korean-American store owner in South Central Los Angeles. The murder occurred on March 16, 1991, and it was just two weeks after the beating of Rodney King. Latasha Harlins entered the Empire Liquor Store to buy orange juice. During a dispute over whether she intended to pay for the juice she was holding, Du shot Harlins in the back of the head, killing her instantly. Harlins was unarmed and had money in her hand at the time. 
just about the pay due. Sun Jia Du was charged with murder, but in a highly controversial decision, she was convicted of voluntary manslaughter. Despite the severity of the crime, the judge sentenced Du to probation, community service, and a $500 fine. This light sentence sparked outrage and further fueled tensions in the already volatile climate of systemic injustice in Los Angeles. Like she didn't serve one day one day in jail, right? And the black community down there was in, they were, they couldn't believe it, right? Yeah. So that decision, and then you have the the Rodney King decision with those three cops getting off. Yeah. It was like lighting, lighting a, a, a match in a, in a, a, a gas tank. Yeah. And, you know, the straw that broke the camel's back. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Piling yeah. up one after another. And then. It reached the climax. Yeah. And then there was the experience of, uh, in Halifax, there was some, you know, uh, there was the Coal Harbor incident. There was. Which which got the, you know, got the treatment of being a racial divide mm -hmm. because it involved a snowball being thrown at, you know, student. Mm -hmm. I, I can't remember which was which now, but uh, yeah. I think it was, was it a white student? throwing it at a yeah anyway i don't really remember matter. man but yeah i remember the the aftermath of it though yeah and mm. then there was the incident when we had our first apartment <laughs> uh which which wasn't a race riot at all um i don't think we were we saw it we, yeah, we did. literally lived down the street yeah and we heard all this ruckus and we and uh we heard we saw two or three people running up the street in the north end uh smashing windows um now, what what started it was at the marquee, something to do with uh, something, and yeah. uh, you know, and then. But remember when we, it made it all the way to the headline of the San Francisco newspaper. Yeah, and we were reading it the next day, going, you know, what the heck? Halifax breaks out in a race man. riot. I know. Yeah, that 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 was. Uh, when would that have been? That would have been nineteen ninety one. Nineteen ninety one. Yeah. And, um, like there, there were, there was a, a small, I think it started off small. Yeah. Um, like protests centered around someone's treatment at the marquee. Right. The club. Yeah. And, and then someone decided to, I don't know if you remember, man, I remember looking out and there was like, literally the street was empty at that time. There was one mm -hmm. guy running down the street going, you're throwing yes. rocks, throwing rocks at uh, storefronts. Yeah. But then that the next night, I don't know if you remember the people that were marching down Godigan Street, man. Do you remember that? Vaguely, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like they, yeah. they, they blocked. They, they actually people were walking down the middle of the street yeah. in protest of mm -hmm. all this stuff, right? Yeah. Of this mm -hmm. supposed race riot, but it wasn't really. <laughs> it was one dude running down the street. Yeah. Um, but throwing rocks at it windows. also goes to show you the power of media oh yeah it also man. goes to show yeah, you uh what can happen when people get hold of a narrative yeah and uh are we the, the narrative that's get made like we're not writing these books no. narratives are other people are people in power and the, you know and i i'm gonna be honest man they use it to their advantage oh, you yeah. get the you get the power of people and the together and the a mob mentality you can create all the sort of distraction you want, you know, yeah. which which actually leads away from the actual cause of what you're trying to deal with in the first mm. place, you know. You know, I, I I laugh about the Halifax thing because it seems so minimal yeah. in in the face of things that are actually quite serious, like uh, mm -hmm. like for for years, like you're saying, like that that uh, that narrative, like they they, it's just recently they've stopped calling. Tulsa a race riot and it's it, yeah. and calling it what it is what it was a massacre massacre yeah yeah right yeah you know 300 uh black people were they've just started finding the mass graves mm -hmm. yeah. of the 300 poor black people that were uh killed yeah you know yeah. Th this is the the first and only time on American soil that um like people were actually bombed from above they used planes yeah. to throw yeah. fire bombs yeah. at this neighborhood yeah um you yeah know? there was the you know i guess the molotov cocktail like yeah you know the and that's that's how they started it yeah yeah 
So then, yeah, the, and, the the erasure of um, at the time what was Black Wall Street. Yeah. The the Thri uh, thriving community. Thriving community, thriving businesses, the erasure of of uh, you know black wealth at that time. Yeah. This is yeah. you know this is and people want to know what systemic systemic racism is. That is it. The yeah. the erasure of uh, of of generational wealth. Yeah. It's gone. Yeah, and it's almost this yeah. this this line that just sticks out in my head is it's almost as like know your place, mm. you know what I mean? It, yeah. And it's horrible. It's like you can't you want a piece of the pie to help your family do better, but if you aspire too much, you know, yeah, you can't have that. It's it's pretty goddamn ridiculous. I don't care what ethnicity you are, like mm. it's pretty ridiculous that people can have that much power into the way people are viewed mm. after the fact you know what i mean yeah very true man very true you have been listening to down home subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts on a high plateau from the one down below to the future of the funk getting lost in the flow contact with the spot my gex now it's time to flex with the force from the soul reaching all aspects getting deep no time to sleep as you reach your next phase laying it all on the line new trail stop the blaze it's a fire inside a brand new path breaking down the sum to one feeling free i just laugh with the joy the song breaking new ground from the breakdown like magic prescribed only to see the perfect blend like a diamond in the rough ready to drop a perfect gem it's time to shine so fine to see what you find